everybody. It's Joe from Joe's Computer Museum. How y'all doing this evening? Did we all uh, enjoy our Tinker Different stream from those wonderful folks over there that made that cool, super awesome forum? I was hanging out there and watched that, and that was really cool. They've done a lot of cool stuff getting that up and running. But let's talk about why I'm here tonight. So we're going to be hanging out and fixing an Apple II GS board. I got sent a board from a client. That board is broken. Um, they said it worked. I got it, and it doesn't work. So something happened in shipping. What? Do I have a fuzzball? I have a fuzzball. Bye-bye, fuzzball. So we need to uh, get that uh, board up and running. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Take a couple minutes to say hi to everybody. We got Steve Mac 84 in the chat. Hey, Mac. Rudy is here. Uh, we got John, BLT, ooh, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. That sounds delicious. Um, Garth, hey, Garth, and Adam G are here. So if you want to see how I go about doing a board level repair of a machine and you like Apple IIs, then this is the stream for you tonight. Um, I'm sporting my Kansas Fest 2019 shirt. I figured I would put that on so that we would uh, be properly thematically attired for the thing tonight. Um, usually I try to put some sort of flair and fun into these uh, these streams, but I just, I had to get this repaired and I figured, I figured I'd just have you all come along for the ride. So there may be long periods of silence where I'm just thinking and pondering and Forgetting that you're all there, but that's okay. Rudy's Retro Endo. Joe, I apostrophe. You apostrophe what? Um, Adam, I have two battery ba battery bomb ROM three boards. I got one to work again. The other is a parts donor. Yeah, and that can happen. Then battery bomb boards, I mean, it depends on how bad the battery bomb is. So to talk about uh, this board specifically, um, let's see if we can switch camera angles so I can show it to you. I believe that is this one. Yep, it's that camera. Shaky cam. So it's this guy right here. It is a ROM3 Apple II GS board. Um, it uh, was battery bombed. I've already cleaned it uh, because showing you guys cleaning it is boring as heck. It's like, it's like two hours uh, on and off of scrubbing and cleaning and ultrasonic and all of that stuff and using vinegar and then using baking soda to negate the vinegar and just whatever. Um, but yeah, the battery was destroyed. Now, the client sent this to me and they said the thing worked perfectly fine with the exception of a 0601 error, which has something to do with serial ports or something. I don't remember exactly what the error message the number means, um, but it was a 0601 and it was really like an inconsequential error. Um, before I even turned the thing on, I decided to go ahead and clean it because I don't want to work with all this gunge on there. And I wanted to make sh absolutely sure the board was perfectly clean before we proceeded. Because, um, you know, it just, it need, we need to get that alkaline junk off of there. So I did that after I cleaned it, it no longer worky. Um, it turns on, nothing catches fire, nothing gets hot. It's not smoking, but I get nothing on the screen over here and nothing occurs. I do need to connect a speaker to it so I could, excuse me, I do need to uh, attach a speaker to it so I can check for the uh, the startup beep. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's not doing anything. Um, I did notice, and I have a note for it to myself to remember, the uh, one of the, uh, one of the diodes on the back is missing, which means that something that's supposed to be connected isn't. So there's a high likelihood that if I just throw a replacement diode on the back uh, underneath here, it'll be perfectly fine, but it remains to be seen. Uh, comments. Garth is installing MacOS 8.6 on the Performa. Good, good, or good luck. Um, Rudy's need, Rudy needs an Apple and a 2C keyboard decoder, and I can help you out with that. That is not a problem. I still have them in stock. Um, won't be able to stay for the whole stream. I got to eat risotto and watch Doctor Who with the wife soon. Understood. Is it Doctor Who night tonight? Um, 2GS board do not let you use the slots. All the built-in ports work, but you can't use anything in a slot. Yeah, slot maker chip is likely, which is, uh, I believe, this one right here. I believe that probably just died or there's traces or something there. And then when the goop gets into the chips, it can destroy chips. So, absolutely. Well, without further ado, let's start digging in here. We'll uh, get it under the microscope, and we're going to take a look at some of the nasties, and we'll see what's going on. Hmm sweet, delicious coffee. And by sweet, I mean not. And delicious, I mean delicious. Okay, so 
I already had everything hooked up here in the corner, but we don't need that hooked up. Uh, this will be the first time I've looked at this guy underneath the, um, the, the scope. So we will see. Need to do a little rearrangement to get it under the scope here. Let's switch to scope cam and get you all focused. Scope cam. Okay, let's get it focused here. That looks pretty good. Are you guys kind of cattywampus and askew? You are a little bit. Let's uh, adjust that so that it stops moving. There we go. Uh, do I know if a slot maker chip from a ROM 3 board will work in a ROM 1 board? Um, I do not know explicitly, but I do not see why not. The boards are not that phenomenally different at an architectural level. Um, it's mostly just adaptations to the memory bus to support more uh, the bigger RAM and ROM, I think. Um, and then just the ROM changes to support the uh, having some of the extra toolbox features in ROM is my understanding. Um, worst case scenario, if you have a spare one, throw it on there. What's what's the worst is going to happen? I mean, the chips are going to are probably have the same pinout and everything, right? You can also look at the part number on the chips. If the part number on the chip is identical, the likelihood it's going to work is like near one hundred percent. So no problem there. No thinking mug. No, no, this is my uh, Star Trek. I don't believe in the no-win scenario mug. This is what my coffee was made in today. Um, and for those of you who've watched me stream before and you have to watch me like pause for a moment while I go get my meds at 9 p.m., I remembered ahead and I have it with me. So when my alarm goes off, I'll be able to just do the thing. So let's go ahead and get started. Um... The bad part of the board is right in here where the, where the battery bomb occurred, and we can see, yeah, the nasties are there, but it's really, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Um, a lot of the stuff just, you know, it does, just does not look, I mean, it's, 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 it's corroded, but it's not destroyed corroded. Um, now, we're just going to take some time and look at the traces in this area and make sure that nothing is just obviously killed. And if I do find something obviously bad, I'll, 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 I'll show you how you find that out. I also need my scrape tool uh, because we may need to scrape traces to get to copper underneath to see if they're okay. Do you guys need a little extra focus? There you go. That'll help you see it better. Um, so those are the traces right around the battery. And actually, that one does not look good. Stand by. Let's get that right back in the screen. That one right there. Yep, that trace looks like that trace is gone. So we're going to have to do something about that. Yep, totally gone. Two minutes in, and we're already doing trace repair. I'm going to switch to my scalpel. It might work better. Stand by. I got the scalpel. I still stole the scalpel trip from um, Steve and uh, Bruce, of course. Your risotto is here. Be back later. Enjoy your risotto. That sounds delicious. I had pizza for dinner tonight. Homemade pizza. Yeah, that trace is just gone. Now, this is one of the power feeds for the battery, probably, or maybe it's this, this crusty thing here. So I'm not sure how necessary this trace is, but it's, it's eaten, so we're going to have to repair it. Just go along and scrape and scrape and scrape and look for bad traces and fix any we find. Can you see what I'm doing? There we are. Again, tonight's just a chill stream. I'm just hanging out, having fun. Super chill. No huge rush to get anything done. I'm going to zoom in on that. Stand by. Focus! Turn the focus ring. That's a Mackiac joke. Um, yeah, that's gone. Mm. 
No trace there. Totally eaten. How this gentleman had this working, I have no idea. Yeah. Now here's a yeah, here's a good candidate spot if you're ever getting to uh, trace repair. These are the kinds of spots you got to look for right here. Hold on, I need to get the board moved a little bit better. This right here is a good candidate spot. Let's get you focused better. There you go. This right here, you see this dark spot? That indicates that the copper underneath the trace has become oxidized and maybe gone. So if we scrape that away, you can, yep, you can immediately see there is nothing underneath there. It is gone completely. No trace. So this is why having the microscope for doing trace level repair is very important. It doesn't have to be this crazy fancy high end one. I just have expensive tastes and a and and I'm also cheap at the same time. It's a weird dichotomy of me. Um, but there are there are some excellent solutions out there for like a hundred or two hundred bucks. Um, you don't have to go with this fancy crazy thing that I went with here. So yeah, this entire trace is just busted the whole way around. It's busted up here. There's nothing there. Yep, it's gone. So this is going to be a nice long fix. Yeah, that might technically still be there, but we should probably replace it anyway. Okay, so we've identified that. Let's look for other bad, potentially bad traces here. That all looks okay to me. Kind of looks like it might have some nasties, like this right here. But we can scrape away the mask and see, nope, that's fine. So that means I don't have to worry about spots like that. But yeah, here, here we go. Here's a tiny little spot that might be a problem. Right here. You see that? Let's check that. Nope, trace still good. But you got to check for those tiny little marks all over the place. So, hi, Thomas. Bye, Thomas. Is it better to scrape or use a DMM continuity test? Uh, uh, it's, eh, it's up to you. You can do it either way, uh, however you want to do it. Uh, the continuity test um, is absolute, but... The thing with the continuity test is that if you if your trace has, how can I put it? Even though I've done a really good job of cleaning this board, you can still get either uh, electrolytes or what's the word we're looking for? Electrolytes or um, um, alkalines or whatever underneath the uh, the the solder mask and along the trace and your cleaner may not get underneath there and neutralize that. And it can just creep along that trace over time. And you think you've got it all, all cleaned with your continuity test. And then you'll find later, like six months down the road, it stops working again. And that's because that alkaline or, 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 or uh, electrolyte or acid or weather just kept creeping along that, that trace. So you got to clean all those traces up. If there's any sort of suspicion that something might be going on, scrape it clean, get it all cleaned out. And then when you're done, you can 10 over it to, um, I, I, it, where possible, I like to 10 and then, uh, solder or put, um, UV solder mask over it, but it's completely up to you. Um, which one of those processes you want to use, of course, but yeah, you really do need to kind of scrape and, and check for any, as uh, Bruce, who just showed up in the chat. Hi, Bruce. Oh, my God. Cat is here. Hi, Cat. Have you ever done board level repair before? Because if you've not, you are in for a treat. Yeah, Josh. Yes, somebody didn't, didn't get the batteries out. Yes, luckily, that this, this isn't that bad of a, isn't that bad. Um, it just looks like some bad traces. Um, but, yeah. So where is that? That is right here. Got to check this. That seems to be okay. There's 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 stuff there, but we still got to scrape it to get any stuff uh any alkaline in there out of the way. And there's uh there's stuff on the back of the board we need to check too. We need to check all these connections uh, to the chips in any area that might have been affected. 
to make sure that, you know, like see, like right here, right here is a good, a good example. Is that good or not? Well, you got to scrape it and find out. You got to scrape it and look. It looks okay. Good. These interconnects are, are places where uh, the copper tends to get uh, hit because there's no mask over top of it to protect the copper. So it can get in there and then creep along that, that trace. Doobie, doobie, doo. Let's go back this way. Here's one thing that uh, that really does concern me in that slot one here. Let's see if we can get in in, in the shot. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but, you know, that right up underneath there is obviously toast. We're going to have to fix those traces. Yep, looks like that's cut through right there. So that trace needs to be fixed. And then up underneath this slot as well. It is, it's hard for me to show on camera, but it is a destroyed mess. So, no, I farm that out to people like you. Thank you, Kat. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate your vote of confidence, and we enjoy helping you guys out do the thing. Uh, send you my A500 plus board. <laughs> um, I can't, I don't remember your post about that, but it doesn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, yeah, even here, look, look, you see the crystals? The crystals and the gunge that are like in 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 here? Like, no, like ugh, get out of there, you. Some of that's probably fiber uh the fiberglass of the board as well. But that stuff can just sit in there. It can just sit in there and creep back out and eat stuff. Apologies on my camera work. It's a little hard to control exactly where the camera is in relation to where I see it because it doesn't show the everything in the frame all at once here. Not for you guys, anyway. Sometimes I can see what I'm doing, but you, can't, you guys can't see what I'm doing. So, Strangers in the night. Josh says, I'm gonna, am I going to pull that connector? Probably. I probably should so I can get underneath it because there, as you can see, yeah, yeah, look up under in between there. All those bad, these bad lines here. Um, if we go one connector over, everything looks pretty good in between. But here, yeah, it's just toast. So we probably do need to pull this connector out to ensure. Yeah, even here, look, look, these vias are just destroyed. I have a feeling I made this board worse by cleaning it, honestly, by uh, running it through the ultrasonic cleaner. But that's okay. I promised I would fix it, and I will make it work. Yeah, just destroyed traces all over the place. Yeah. That's where the battery was. So that, that's just surface, surface gunge there. Yeah, it just comes out rust, technically. Yeah. Yep, we're definitely going to need to pull, replace, repair a lot of traces and get this connector out of the way. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. It's a little bit hard for me to work with it zoomed in quite that far. What via exactly? Does anybody know if the Apple II GS is a three layer board? Three or four layer board. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, that trace is gone. Completely gone. I have no idea how this guy had it. He's like, it works just fine, and he sent me pictures. I have no idea. I have no idea how it worked. This is an absolute mess. I'm going to have to ultrasonically clean this again before I even repair it. Welcome to, welcome to Scraping Traces with Joe, a live stream. Gee, many Christmas. What a mess. This poor guy. Yeah, there's no via here. That trace connects to nothing. This trace up here connects to nothing. Wow. 
Slice it in half and find out. <laughs> yeah, not with this board. Well, maybe with this board. If this board ends up being completely destroyed, we may have to. I may have to buy it from the guy and be like, sorry, dude. You sent it to me working, but it, it's no. Mm -mm. Yeah, this 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 is here is supposed to be a solid piece of iron or steel that goes through here, and it has turned into literal rust, just iron salt. It's just look at that. You guys can't see it. Just look at this. It's just turned into muck. Desoldering gun, I don't need it. I can just wheel it back and forth and it comes out. Insanity. Stand by. Yeah. Let's look at the back of the board just for giggles. Just for giggles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that slot was never going to work, was it? Those pins aren't even frigging connected. They're not connected. The solder has been completely eaten out of all of all of it. That is crazy. Oh. Am I are my eyes deceiving me? Are my eyes deceiving me? Does that look like a previous repair to you? That looks like this is somebody's had a go at this already. I might be wrong. That might just be might just be artifacts. But that looks like a, a, a aftermarket uh, UV mask. Wow. I fixed a V once using cut off bit of yeah yeah you can fix it yeah you you can fix those with anything you want as long as it works. And traces upon traces upon traces gone. This I, this can't have worked. This guy's board cannot have worked before he sent it to me. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible that this thing worked. It's like this is memory bus here. That's just. I mean, a lot of this stuff does go to the slot, so there's nothing to the slots. It's whatever. But it looks like it was done in the factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This board is just toast. I still don't think it's too far gone, to be honest. I mean, it's just trace repair. As long as the chips work, and he had it working, in theory it'll work. But anyway, we'll just keep working it. I like to twerk it, twerk it. I like to... Did I just say that? I'm weird. Anyway, here, look at me, not my background, because I'm important. Wow, just. Well, this guy, his uh, labor, his labor estimate may go up, unfortunately. That's okay. We will work with him to figure it out. If any, any of you are uh, wondering about my services, yes, I do this for a fee. I charge a modest fee. Um, wow, that my knife is working better than the scalpel is. Anyway, we will stick to my knife. And my knife can be infinitely sharpened. Um, I do uh, collect a modest fee for doing this. It's usually parts plus an estimated hourly rate. Um, my rate is also somewhat negotiable, depending on what I believe my skill is in, in, in comparison to the, the complexity of the problem. Um, or if I run into it where, in this case, hi, Tom, um, in this case, yeah, the physical mechanical connections may have been washed away, yeah. Uh, in this particular case where they send it to me working and then I plug it in and it didn't work. And I was gonna ultrasonically clean it anyway when I was done and I was gonna like, uh, likely was going to, it was going to not work no matter, it didn't matter whether I ultrasonically cleaned it first or later, whatever, it was probably going to just not work. Um, you know, in that specific case, uh, 
uh, I tend to be a little bit nicer about it because I mean, the, the pictures were sent to me and all of that, everything seemed like it was working fine. Then I touched it and it stopped working. I tend to be a little, a, a little, or actually quite a mo lot more lenient on it. As long as the under there's the understanding that, okay, well, it might take me a, lo a lot longer time to do it. I have to work in between projects to get it done. So as long as everybody understands that, I'll get it done. Joe's Computer Museum, would you go to space to fix a satellite? That is a really good question. Is that a, is that a true rhetorical question or what? Um, sure. I mean, if I was the qualified person to do it, and I was given the proper training to go up there and do it, I guess. Why not? Space is cool. Yeah, these things are destroyed. Now, this, this entire, um, uh, this entire uh, diode just fell off uh, during ultrasonic cleaning. If I were to look in the bottom of my, my cleaner, it's probably floating around down there. I mean, it just, it, it's gone. That via is gone. Look at that. Just salt. Nothing but metal salt. Man. Just got to get it clean. Keep cleaning it. That's just a resistor. That's not a big deal. Little capacitors and stuff. Is that diode on there firmly? Yeah, that's not going anywhere. Iron rust, anybody? Man. Uh, that is a BC-22. I don't know what that is supposed to be. I'll have to look at another board and figure out what that is. That's another missing component. solder's just falling apart. Don't breathe this dust, kids, by the way. This is this is lead-based dust. Well, it looks like there's plenty of uh, copper there. Man, just crusted beyond all anything. There was a mention, should you, uh, should you test with a multimeter or scrape first? Uh, I'm still in the camp of scraping because it allows you to see anything blatantly obvious. So you know what to actually test with your multimeter. Otherwise you're just testing everything and kind of like shotgunning it and like not sure that that actually helps your process. Besides, scraping these traces is somehow like weirdly cathartic. Mm. Delicious, delicious, whatever this salty stuff is. Apologies if I'm not paying attention to the chat. I'm just literally just chill streaming tonight. This is this is one of those things that like ends up on one of those TikToks or uh, or whatever, like uh, you know, super satisfying whatever, where they're like, you know, they're making some object that looks satisfying to make or what you know, whatever, whatever those weird cathartic things are. And scraping clean traces. Biologically, it probably goes back to, you know, the human need to, uh, to groom, you know, uh, and uh, our primal monkey pre, uh, forebears, you know, cleaning nits of each other's uh, fur and stuff like that. It's probably, I know that sounds nasty, but it's probably something similar to that to, to do cleaning like this, that why we find that soothing and cathartic. Oh, 
Looks like there's plenty of metal there, but that might not be connected. Mm, it might be. Yeah, that's connected. Cleaning your boards for fun and profit. When I'm done, I might just have to like take literally like a painter's brush and paint this with with ultraviolet or with a uh, UV mask. Honestly, God, there's so much, so much bad with this board. How did this thing function? I have no idea how this how this guy's board functioned. I just don't know. Getting out of the target zone there. It looks like that's that's doing pretty okay. Oh, we got a bad spot right there. Isn't there a chemical solution you can use to dissolve it? What, this nastiness stuff? Um, not water, maybe. Um, the these are basically uh, metal salts that uh, acid won't dissolve it and alkaline won't dissolve it. Um, they're just kind of there. I might be able to use some sort of organic, organic solvent like uh, dichloromethane or something like that to dissolve it, but I don't want to go anywhere near that stuff. Basically, we just scrape it to get rid of it. Apple II GS is the only Apple II model with an onboard battery, generally speaking, yes. What is the best way to contact me about a repair? You go to jcm-1.com. Click services at the top and follow the instructions. Yeah. Uh, and Josh is saying citric acid will help in some cases, but mechanical removal, yeah, I agree. Mechanical removal just helps you, just it gets it out of the way. The, the problem with chemical removal is that the chemical removal removals that might tend to work on uh, a lot of these uh, these alkaline salts uh, are also going to eat the bare metal itself. Like citric acid is going to attack that copper um, the same way anything else does. So, yeah. Sandblast. Yeah, you could do that. I wouldn't suggest it. In some cases, you can use sandpaper. I've done that before um, in areas uh, like a high, like a low grit sandpaper, for example, um, in areas where like, like when I need to be absolutely sure that, that the, the, the status of an area, sometimes I'll use a, 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 a fine grit sandpaper to polish the traces, to polish that area more than more, more to polish it than to sand it, if that makes sense. I don't know if this gentleman is on the stream tonight who sent me this board. He is a follower. Maybe he's here. I don't know. You see, that all looks okay in that area. Then we got this area up here that's not so good. Seriously, this board, if I manage to make this work, it's going to be kept together with UV solder mask. I mean, that's what's going to be holding it together. Wow. Craziness. Just, it's just nothing but, mm. yep, there's a spot right there.
That's all gone. Nothing on any of those traces. Totally gone. Yep. Wow. Crazy. Craziness. How do you fix bad vias? Very good question. Um, bad vias can be fixed by a couple different methods. Um, so typically it depends on how the how how bad the via is, or or not not how bad the via is, um, the function of that via. If it's a via just connecting the top and the bottom of the board, you can basically run a piece of enameled wire through the hole, solder it to the trace on the top, solder it to the trace on the bottom. Boom, Bob's your uncle. If it is a through via that is used for a for pin connection, you have to do a little bit extra work. In those cases, I tend to uh, like to use 30 gauge wire wrap wire um, that has that ha that's been stripped clean because then that makes sure that inside the hole itself, next to the pin that goes through the hole, it's completely um, there. There's no enamel you have to burn off. It makes absolutely sure the solder is going to go down through that hole and connect not only the traces on both sides but the pin in the via. If the via is one where it's a multi-layer board, um, you don't. Um, a multi-layer board that has completely failed. Um, or that has internal traces where where the goop has gone into the trace and then gone in the layers between the top and the bottom. Um, unless you have a schematic and you are an electronics engineer, um, those can be pretty hard to suss out, even if if the trace is bad or the trace of the V are bad, where the trace and via go to. You got to find all the points that it might connect to, solder it to a trace, and run a, a patch wire here or there or whatever. So. Uh, Kat says, this is far from the worst board she's ever seen. Yeah, they're, mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> Athena Nova, I've seen worse Amiga 2000 boards. There's a local, um, there's actually, if you go way back in my history, you can see an interview I did with a local history museum. They have a, a tiny little computer museum inside there, um, with donations from local businesses. And that's the, that's the connection to the local history here. And they have an Amiga 2000 in there with a battery bomb on it. Um, and they let me take it apart and look at it. And it started, it was starting to go. And I told them, uh, I understand that you're trying to keep this, this, a, a, in original kind of museum piece, but you need to clip that battery out of there. And they refused. And that was about five, six years ago and they still haven't done it. So I'll bet that machine doesn't work now, but you know, you can't make everybody, you know, you can't make people pay attention to good advice. You can only just give it and hope. I don't want to use that. I want to use this. This works better. <laughs> yeah, that pin is just completely free. Just moves. Man. That said, even with all this damage, I would figure that the machine should probably still work because this stuff is all in the I.O. area with the slots and stuff. Uh, not a lot of this has much to do with the with the low level function of the computer, um, but the computer doesn't turn on. So there's a there is a possibility that um, by turn on, well, I say, it turns on. It doesn't fry or anything like that. Um, but I don't get anything on the screen. It's possible that one of these traces up in here actually routes from uh, the video chip, the VGC, up to the video connector, and that's why, or, you know, or any part of that, and that's why I'm not getting anything, but whatever. Yes, they refused. I can't, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah, that, that trace is gone. This, uh, I can confirm this board is probably going to get nowhere near fixed on this stream. I might be lucky and I might be able to get it to post. 
Jesus criminy, look at this. Man. Unbelievable. Gun search. All right, we're going to flip back to the front side of the board just for a minute. Oh, it's out of focus. Stand by. There you go. I'd replace the slot connector. Yeah, I'm going to, that just need, we need to yank that out because there are traces underneath that slot connector. All of those, I guarantee you every single one of these, the, these traces is bad. And they cross connect all the slot connectors together. So if they're bad, so if the, if the ones around slot one are bad, that means none of the slots probably work. Absolutely. Absolutely. As the meme goes. And to fix these traces, I'm going to have to take the slot connector out anyway. Does anybody know if you can get replacement replacement slots for these? Because I guarantee you, I'm going to need one. This thing is not going to come. Not it is not going to come out without a fight. I may have to cut it out. Trace just gone, just gone. Unbelievable. Chill, chill lo-fi stream for study. <laughs> Man, all those busted connections. I estimate 8 to 12 hours of repair work. Yep, 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 yep. Cat is mine is Minecrafting. Yeah, you can just listen to me, Mike. Make make nails on chalkboard scraping noises that might uh, might make you think it's a spider or something while you're Minecrafting because it's about the same sound. Man, this board might be a donor. I might have to. Talk to this guy about about this board. Just like the whole trace here is just gone. It's put. It is. It's it's beyond pulled up. It was just ate all the way along there and is just vapor. This turned into vapor. Crazy, 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 crazy. This is going to be uh, end up be being kind of like uh, Steve's Quadra, probably the one that's uh, plagued him for ten years. Mac eighty four Steve, don't know if he's still in the chat there, but he has this Quadra eight forty or whatever that he works on. It's eight forty, I think it's an eight forty AV, might be it's nine forty AV or something, and it's his cursed machine. He just like years and years of trying, he just 
it just it gets better, then it gets worse, then it gets better, then it gets worse, and well, those all look good. Generally speaking, that uh, that was chip. That's the flop. This is the floppy controller chip here. It does not look like it's in too good of shape. When the corrosion goes up the side of the package, there, you you have to worry about that because that means the corrosion could have crept into the chip itself and hurt the chip. Man, all right. Well, I'm gonna flip to a different screen because we're going to see about getting this socket off here. Let's give you a slightly different angle. Maybe a little bit closer. I'm going to get my bench protector out of the way. More like board protector. I put uh, static board, uh, bags down underneath boards because as you can see, my bench is a mess, and I might have little pieces of metal floating around. It helps prevent the board from shorting out. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and get the magic sock tool going here. Let's get the power supply out of the way. Come over how you power supply. Go right there. Need the magic suck tool. Where where did I put the thingy? You guys just saw me have the yellow there, the metal thingy. Here it is. Here's the metal thingy. Turn that on. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. So I am going to do a little prep work here. We are going to add flux all the way along this socket. And then I'm going to make an absolutely awful attempt to reflow the pins because if I can get the if I can fix the eutectic mixture, that's a that is a chemical nerd term. If I can fix the eutectic mixture of the gunge in the holes here, um, I may be able to get uh, the sucker machine to suck stuff out well or suck it out better if that makes sense so let's see here uh where is the socket there's the socket need to focus on the socket there we are okay where's my sod solder solder s-o-d-d-e-r Garth Beagle, ten dollars super chat. Thank you very much, sir. Let the poor thing go. Yeah, this one is for a client, so I'm gonna at least give it a try and get an idea of what the how bad it is before I give them that that whatever. I hope my TGS has a lot of life left in it. I just replaced the battery in it last night. Yeah, if the battery hasn't exploded and the capacitors haven't gone all crazy, you should be fine. Luckily, the capacitors on this are are uh, big fat ones or or little solid ones, so they tend not to have you have any problems. Acid rain, what temperature you use. Um, on my soldering iron, I use a temperature of 390. It's a little bit lower than what most people use, but I'm kind of crazy about not frying traces on the board. Uh, on my on my sucky sucky tool here, the, the um um machine, that um, it's up about halfway. Uh, it doesn't really have a temperature range. It has a, a number from one to five. I put it on about two or two and a half. Uh, don't solder in shorts no matter how hot the room is. Don't ask how I know. Uh-huh. Been there before. Um, so yeah. Let's uh ESD is the least of my problems. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh Josh, I, I don't use it for ESD in this particular case because this entire mat is grounded in the corner. I'm not worried about ESD on this mat. Um, I do all my work here and I do I clip lots of things and some sometimes little pieces of metal or dots of solder or something get onto this. And so I like to add an ESD bag between it and the thing I'm working on um, when when it's bare on the bench like that, if when I'm turning it on. Um, I, I had it turned on earlier just to see what the board did. Um, but I do that just to prevent the, the board from shorting out on any junk on, that might be on the bench. That's all. So let's go ahead and switch views back to scope cam so you guys can see me trying to clean up some of this solder. Okay. 
focus for you. You need better focus. You need better focus. There you go. What microscope brand are we using, Joe? Amscope. Yep, it's an Amscope dual arm with the 75, uh, 75 times zoom as a bar low lens on it, which helps gives me more room uh, underneath to uh, to work. Um, and I just have some a 1080p camera that Amscope happens to sell with it um, mounted to it. So I have that connected to my computer as a stream input uh, for being able to pipe into OBS to stream so you guys can watch it. It also allows me to take pictures really close to the board for sending to folks if they want to see that. So we're just going to see if I can get this solder in there. Yeah, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get this solder to stick or melt or do anything. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm literally just burning off the wick or the, uh, the, uh, what is this stuff? Flux. Yes. Now that one's melting. Okay. Again, the trick is to change the eutectics and get, uh, change, you know, basically the, the, mixture of metals in there to get it back to an actual soldery like state and uh and ha get rid of all the salts and the junk that are mixed in because that's what causes it problems with melting get out of there solder ball get rid of a little bit of that just a little bit By adding a little extra solder to it, it gets more good of the, you know, the good mixture of metal mixed in with the crappy screwed up solder that's full of pock holes and salts and oxidized junk. So that when I go to pull it out with the tool, with the suck tool, it'll actually pull the solder out. Going along, clean up the pins. Cleaning up the solder points. Getting rid of the bad solder, replacing it with good solder so it melts properly. So that the the noise maker tool can get it out. You can melt any day now. You can do it. You can do it. Good job. Yay, thank you. Does it work yet? Lol. Curtis solders now usually end up picking it out with a pin. Yeah, it depends. It depends on it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. See you, Garth. Hypothetically speaking, Bruce Bruce asks a really good question. Hypothetically speaking, Joe, let's say you invest six hours in the board, but you still can't get it to work. Will you charge your customer for that time, even though it's not fixed? That is a really good question. Um, I would, I'm going to say it depends. It really does depend. Different people are going to, are going to handle that in different ways. I tend to be a really, really nice person. I come from a, a retail background to begin with and a repair background of repairing computers, not at the board level, but, you know, repairing PCs and, we always, uh, we always said, you know, if we if we get into a computer and and we spend a lot of time and we can't repair it, 
we come up with some sort of number to help cover our time because you know our our time is worth something our knowledge is worth something but the at the end of the day we didn't fix it right so there's you also have to look at it from uh you have to look at it from the perspective of the uh of the end user, right? They're expecting you to get it fixed. And if they get it back not fixed, have they received any value, right? So it's it's a balance. Um, I tend to be really nice about it. Um, if it's a situation where I'm sure I can fix it, it's just gonna take way longer than uh, either of us expected it to be. Um, that's where we, we negotiate. Uh, or where I tend to negotiate it. Um, I'll be like, okay, so I think it's going to take me a really long time to get this done. How fast do you, how fast meaning what priority level do you want it to be repaired at? If you let me just kind of tinker on it a little bit and tinker on it a, bit, a little bit and tinker on a little bit and take six months to get it done, uh, I tend to be a lot nicer about it because I, I mean, I do this as a hobby. I know I just enjoy doing it. Is my time worth something? Yes. Um, do I run this as my primary business or is this my primary income route? No, but I also have to balance that against the, I don't want to be so inexpensive and so nice that people just throw me stuff because they know I'm going to be a nice guy and not charge them anything. You know what I mean? So there's a, there's a big balance there. Um, I go in with a limit for heavy trace rares. Once that limit is reached, I have to do with progress and viability for further work. Agreed. Same thing. Um, what I want to do is I want to get I do want to get this socket out um, and then see where we are with the trace uh, trace repairs under that socket and get a good good idea. And at that point, we would probably be stopping and I, I would be talking to this guy, and being like, "Hey, yeah, it worked when he sent it to me. I cleaned it before I started working on it, and crap fell off the board, and it stopped working. Even if I hadn't cleaned it before, I was going to clean it after. So if I had repaired it and cleaned it after, it was going to stop working when I cleaned it." So it doesn't matter. The board was on borrowed time anyway. And that, that's that's one thing that kind of, how can I put it? It complicates it a little bit because the, the guy sent it to me working. Now it's not working. Have I just broken this person's board? Well, no, absolutely not. I haven't done anything uh, beyond uh, the recommended. I cleaned it, right? I didn't, I didn't clean it with sandpaper. I didn't take a, you know, a sandblaster to it. I wasn't using metal scrapers or anything on it. I used a plastic brush and an ultrasonic cleaner. And if that made things that were already about to fall off, fall off of it and cause it to not work more, or if that caused traces that were just hanging on by a thread to get vibrated off and fall off, that could have happened in shipping. That could have happened before I even put it in the ultrasonic cleaner. Um, is it my fault for not turning it on first to check it? Probably. But... You know, it is what it is. That board wasn't dead. It was undone. Exactly. Yeah. Zombie board. Like it was this, this board. Now the, 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 the user did clean it up a bit themselves. They did some scrapey scrape to get the, a lot of the gunge and stuff off. They removed the, so the battery socket and all that stuff. Um, but even though they cleaned it and it worked, that doesn't mean, and I, I don't want to like put this on the person themselves or anything like that because everyday users aren't, you know, they don't do board level repair. They don't know, right? It's like asking an insurance adjuster to fix a car. They're not going to know how to fix a car, right? I don't know how to adjust insurance, right? So, but if they didn't get all the, the nasties off of the board, even if... I didn't clear, clear, thoroughly clean it. Even if I fixed only what was necessary to fix the 0601 issue, it was going to die eventually again because we didn't get all of the alkaline off because that alkaline will creep along the traces and just keep eating it until it breaks one and then the machine stops posting. Sorry, that's a PC term. Power on self-test. The machine stops booting, basically. So, yeah. Kind of off, off uh, Robin, or around Robin Hood's bar to answer your question there, but yeah. D 
Dooby dooby doo. So we're going to proceed with trying to get this socket off the board. I don't know if we're even going to succeed doing it. I could probably breathe on it and the solder joints would just break, but you know, whatever. A little too much solder on the iron there. Of course, getting these large sockets out themselves is a pain in the butt because you got all these connections you got to break. I mean, when it's a, like a little two pin uh, resistor or something, or even like a 14 pin socket or something, it, those, those come out fairly easily. But when you got 50 pins here, you know, memory sockets, for example, they are just absolutely killer to try to remove. And I suspect I'm going to have problems trying to get this out of here. I mean, the board already doesn't work. It's not like I'm going to make it any worse. That pin is just... Yeah, those are all just loose in there. Those will just pop right out. Yeah, that's just crust. That, if I just yank on it, that'll probably just break. That's loose. That's loose. That's loose. I mean, yeah, this alkaline literally just ate the solder. Just ate it. This Amtec Flux is really taking one for the team. I might have to switch. Yeah, I use the Amtec, the Amtec Flux. It works really well. Um, I've used uh, several different Fluxes uh, over the years. Um, we'll switch you to the side camera here so you can see. That's the Flux that I use. Focus on the Flux, please. Amtec NC559-V2-TF. It works really good. It's You can't smell it. Uh, you can, but it's, like, it's not super stinky. It doesn't smell like... Um, it doesn't smell like the pits of hell when you uh, when you uh, when you when it melts and burns off. It stays in place. Um, yeah, it does a really good job. So before we do this, I'm cleaning uh, cleaning my uh, vacuum desoldering tool. This is a general thing that I do when I work on. Every time I turn it on, I will heat it up, make sure that the stuff inside the uh, the, the the cavity there is melted so that I can scrape it out. Then I take out the little plunger and I clean out the inside of the thingy, the receiver as it's called. Just doing this off camera, standby. Where's my pokey tool? There it is. are. Make sure that's clean. Eh, I could clean the inside of that a little bit. If I really have, if I really suspect I have problems, I'll, um, I will take the, I'll take the, 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 um, the nozzle out and I'll actually use the, the thing here that came with it, the scrapey tool, whatever you want to call it. You can tell I love my technical terms, um, and I will actually clean the inside of the barrel. I don't think I don't think I will need to do that, but we'll see. Cool. Um, um, I want a burning flux, burning flux and cap juice cologne. No, no. Actually, come to Kansas Fest and go to the room where Sark and Cat and Javier and all of them uh, hang out. Um, yeah, that place smells like that all the time. Um, do you guys want a slightly better view of this? You wanna see a little bit better what I'm doing? A little bit closer maybe? I don't know, what view is best? Like this, 
Is that view better? Is that a better view, maybe? I don't know. You get to see my leg. Um, cool. Let's see if we can get this cleaned out. Clean, make sure that the chamber is still clear, or the nozzle is still clear, and then continue. If anybody's wondering if I have a fume extractor, no, I don't. I just have a Noctua fan plugged into, it's right up here, you can't see it. I have a Noctua fan plugged into my bench power supply, providing 12 volts to just blow the smoke out of the way. Uh. Those are the bad ones. We're going to not worry about that. I have an um machine. Yes. Exploded Reef Ascent Perfume would be a good seller. You are evil. Um, you can buy lasers that burn rust off of metal. The metal is left unmarked underneath. That would be neat. Yeah, cat. It's a permanent smell. Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. I have Javier singing Strangers in the Night. I am sorry. Um... Yeah, Dave's Vintage uh, Apple Tech. If I buy a uh, 68K Mac on eBay, I always request a photo of the motherboard from the seller. It's a Mac. We call them logic boards. Um, a motherboard from the seller. If they don't comply, you pass on it. Good. Smart, smart. Great leg view. 10 out of 10. Caught my watch. <laughs> Boom. Wow. Wow. Um, you make it look so easy. I have that gun, but keep burning VS. Acid rain. Turn your um, Turn your temperature down. Um, you want the you want your um gun to be right about the same temperature as your soldering iron. Um, if it's up too high, you end up just literally burning through everything. Um, you want it basically just high enough to melt the solder. It doesn't have to be any higher than that. Um, for what you're trying to do here, now uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a tangent here. So stand by. We're gonna talk about this gun and some of my theories on it. Face cam time. So. The um gun. Why does it have temperature settings that go all the way up to 9,000 if that kills boards? Well, the reason is if you're using the um gun with a big fat nozzle because you're desoldering heat sinks or something like that, that's why you need that extra heat setting. Um, but when you're doing these small boards and stuff, these VIAs are tiny. There's not a lot of thermal mass there. And you can just end up destroying. Tr pulling out traces, pulling out vias, doing all that nastiness, putting too much heat into the pins that so goes through and melts the plastic shroud the pin is attached to, and all of that. So in my case, I have this currently set to, it has settings from one to four, and the temperature ranges are, it actually shows the temperatures on it. Ah, uh, nice. Um, the temperature that I have it set to is two. Um, and the temperature of two is about 400 degrees Celsius, which is about the same temperature that I put my soldering iron at. So I just put it at that same temperature. If you need it cranked way up, you can do that. So you have a lot of extra thermal mass, but you really don't need the temperature up above that for most use. So keep the temperature down. Yeah, yeah. Nicholas, if, if it's too low, you sit too long and you damage stuff too. Yeah, because what happens is you get that thermal conductivity through before the solder melts. So it's a balancing act. That's why that typical solder range is that 400 degree Celsius range. Um, I tend to like it a slightly on the lower side, but that's just me, but whatever. Back to, back to side cam. Yeah.
Let's continue the um machine. Now you're gonna hear it making that when it hear when it starts to make kind of warbly noises. It usually means that uh, the nozzle needs a little clean or something. usually don't solder it face down. I will usually solder it at the side like this, um, like that. And the reason why is it just, this is just my personal opinion from experience and also having done a lot of um, desoldering of boards that I have to be super, super careful with because they're actually um, rare vintage pieces. Uh, if you put the gun like this, and melt that solder, it's going to have a tendency to use gravity and wick downward. And then it can actually, you, you won't necessarily get all the solder out. If you do it sideways, or even better, upside down, if you can manage to do that, if you do it sideways, you're going to have less of that gravitational effect. That's just me. That's how I do things. Um, hi, Mac84 Steve. Welcome back. I had a Mac Classic about from the site, uh, that old Apple stuff back in 2000, a couple years ago, decided no longer to want to boot, so I donated Awesome. Keep the Macs in the family. Get them to people who can use them. And those are all the pins that are already that have already deleted themselves. So we don't have to worry about those. So let's switch camera angles again. Take a look at this under the scope. Get an idea of what it looks like. Let's see if we have any we need to continue to work on. Javier just posted a new, vote, a new video. He's trying to lure my audience away. We have the same audience. He's not luring anybody away. He's distracting you while, while you, and then you'll either come back or you'll view my thing later or you'll stick here and go view his or whatever. Hav and I go way back. Um, scope cam. Okay, so are you in focus? There you are. So let's look at these pins. Where, where are pins? There they are. So those two on the end there look like they need a little more work. So we're going to add a little more solder to it. This one here looks like I didn't get it completely clean. But again, that's that eutectic mixture thing I was talking about. If the solder isn't good, it won't, uh, it won't clear out. Those all actually look pretty good. And those, those at the end are still crud. Not a lot I can do that. I think we're just going to have to break those the old-fashioned way. Yeah, that's so soft. I'll probably just yank on it. It'll probably pop out. I have to, still have to be careful, but you know. Yeah, this one's crusty. Let's clean this up and see if we can get this get to any good solder there. And then if so, I might be able to get that to melt and get that out of there. That one loose, 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 yeah. Mmm, we got gray slime, guys. Gray slime. Lead salts mixed in with flux. Delicious. Mmm. 
Yep, that just does not want to try to do anything. Yep. I might have to cut and drill that one. It happens. It happens. That one's mostly free. Yeah. Some of these are still kind of stuck to the side of the via, but that's not a big deal. What I'm doing here is I'm just poking at each one of these to see if they're free. If they're close to free but not quite free, usually you can just give them a nice little push and the solder will pop apart. The, any tiny little solder bridge will pop apart and then it'll it'll be free to be released from the other side. If they're really tough to move and they don't move easily, you don't want to force it because then you can destroy the via. And then you just re-add solder, re-vacuum it. You keep doing that a couple times until it's free to move in the hole. That's what helps you prevent helps prevent you from destroying your vias. This one needs to be redone. Stand by. Just remelt it. And now, again, we're to the really nasty ones that aren't going to melt no matter what I do to them, probably. Yeah, it's not. The solder just doesn't even take into the into the hole. Just that's going to have to be cut and drilled. Hey, look, I found another bad trace. Yay! Boo! Okay. So let's get these couple that are stuck released. Okay. Squeak! Reading people's comments. Another problem uh, you have is sometimes solder gets stuck in the via. Gun will not suck it out. So going all, all the way back, victim of Max L. Better your yes. Good luck, Joe. Thanks for the stream. See some of you folks on the later. See you, Josh. I'll give you a dollar to eat it. You're funny. Uh, is Joe removing the slots? Very thorough. I have to. Um, Herb, uh, welcome to the stream, by the way. Uh, there are some traces that go under slot one of this board um, that are destroyed. Um, and I have to get the so slot out to check them, clean them, trace repair them before I put the slot back in. Um, sometimes, uh, again, sometimes solder gets stuck in the via. The gun will not suck it out. Add more solder, suck it again. Add more solder, suck it again. Add more solder, suck it again. Again, this goes back to that comment that I said about the eutectic mixture. You want to get that, if any of the solder that is in there is 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 really nasty, like if you can melt it, but it doesn't all come out, you want to keep adding solder and removing, adding, removing, adding, removing until it comes out clean. Worst case scenario, if you really, really have to, um, you can uh, cut the, the component out, but leave the lead in. Take your iron to the, to the via hole to melt the solder, then just kind of very carefully, slowly pull that lead out to leave nothing inside there. Then you can use something like this stuff to clean the via out the old fashioned manual way. Soldering is an art form. Yes. I hear Poncho does a good job of repairing vias. <laughs> yes. So somebody is asking a question are what are vias? A via, yep. And somebody answered a via is a conductive hole that connects layers of the board. That is correct. Did we get it off yet? Not quite there, cat. 
Uh, we had a missing a stuffy situation. Oh, no. Um, hi, Richard Techie. How you doing? So let's continue. Oh, I ran into the camera. You got to see my paunch. Um, okay, so let's continue the work here. Um, where was I? Yes, we were doing solder gun um work. Let's change the angle a little better so you guys can see what I'm doing. You just can't, you can't see because I'm the worst camera person ever. I'm trying to get you close enough to the board so you can see it, but also at an angle so that you're not like, what's going on? That one looks better. All right. I'm going to check those under the scope. I'm not going to switch camera angles. I'm just going to check it real quick. Oh, yeah. Much better. Cool. So now we can try very, 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 very carefully to get this socket out. Put that to the side. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Oh, yeah. It's pretty loose. I don't think I'm going to have much problem getting it out. Yeah, you can see. See how loose this is? This one doesn't move at all. But this one's like, wiggle wobble, wibble wobble. Not forcing it. Just working it very slowly. If you force things out, especially vias, you can yank vias and traces and everything out. Just like pulling teeth. No, Herb. Um, actually, when they pull teeth, they use extreme amounts of force, and they break your teeth into li tiny little bits. Because they, because your body will heal itself. This board will not heal itself. We've got something down here. It just doesn't want to release. Very light prying force. I'm not really forcing it too hard. Just trying to ease it out. All right, I'm going to flip it over, look at the back, and see what's stuck. Uh, like this. Yep, that one pin right here. It's the only one that's giving me fits. Just this one pin. Zoom out, refocus, jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. Yep, this pin, right? That one pin that was crusty. This one. You can't see it. I don't, I know I don't have it on the screen, but trust me. I'm going to switch so you can see. This pin right here is not letting me release this. Focus for you guys. There you go. Oh, where'd my knife go? There it is. Folks are talking about sockets. I don't know what you're talking about, but I love the fact that you're having a nice little side conversation. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's basically these two pins right here. They're just, just holding on for dear life. They don't want to come out. I'm going to put a little downward, downward pressure with my knife on the back of this pin to see if I can get it to pop through. Doesn't really want to go. Okay. I'm going to get a little more forceful, but not too forceful. I'm just going to clean the crud around from the edge of this to see if we can get this to loosen up. Just does not want to go. Try 
try giving it a little heat. I know this isn't going to do anything, but I as well try it. Well, I don't know. It looks like it sort of freed up the hole. Sort of. Kind of. It didn't, but, you know. Just doesn't want to, doesn't want to let go. I mean, it looks like it's wiggling in there, but it's, it doesn't want to go through. Well, I just folded it in half. This one is going to, over here is going to be a problem as well. We're going to have the same issue with this. My soldering iron just beeped at me for reasons I don't know. Don't know what that's about. Hey, look at that. I was able to get that one cleared. Which one is this? The third one? Is it the third? Ah, I lost it. And, uh, it's the second, third one down. This one. What are people talking about? Get out the hammer. Yep. Mm hmm. Eye hammer. Tap them down like nails with a small hammer. Yes. When a capacitor pops, it also causes a problem like this. It can. Um, the problems with capacitors tend to be actually a little less worse. Um, when a battery bomb goes, it it is it's the, we call them battery bombs for a reason. They just blow. Capacitors tend to be slower and a little more insidious. Um, but the electric light electrolytes do the thing. Yeah. Yeah, adding some fl flux and fresh solder. And, and yeah, exactly. I mean, y you got me uh, uh, there, Steve. Um, always with the super helpful stuff. The trick is, is all that solder that's already in there has turned to nothing. It's like I can't even get a good mixture on it because there's nothing for it to mix to. Like there's just nothing in that hole. It's salt, basically. But of course it worked. I tried it because Steve said so, and I tried it, and would you look at that? It melted and went in the hole. So, you know, Steve knows what he's talking about. Steve's smart guy. Where's my... Where, where, hello, solder. There it is. All right, let's try pulling it out here. It's the fourth one down. Check it. Slightly better. Still really doesn't want to go down through. Try this other one. Fourth one down. It looks like it might be free. Let's try it. Ha ha! And side cam. I see we're past the tray tra scraping. Yeah, sort of. We kind of took a, hey Rudy, we took a, we took a kind of a, 
a side trip here um, to get this socket out so that we could get underneath and do more tray scraping. It's out. Thank you, Steve, to your awesomeness. I appreciate your reminder of keep adding more solder until it goes. Great new video, Mac84. Is that your VCF video there, uh, Steve? Um, let's look at this under the scope, shall we? Nasty! Scopecom. Mmm, doesn't that just make you hungry? Don't you love that? <laughs> Wow. Oh, man. I mean, I bet if I clean the pins, it'll still work. Clean the pins and do a lot of, like, cleaning, a lot of uh, scraping and whatnot. But, man. Yes, any of you, if you're not following... If you're not following Steve, Mac84 Steve on his channel, go check him out. Just search for Mac84 TV, I believe, on YouTube, and you will find the guy. Um, so now what we need to do is we need to clean up underneath Mr. Socket here and uh, do any possible trace repair we have to do there, or at least identifying what we're going to be doing. At this point, I'm not sure I'm going to be doing any trace repair on this tonight. This is more, at this point, it's kind of evolved into an exploratory surgery type of thing. So we're going to get down in here. Um, you can't see what I'm doing. We're going to get down in here and look at that a little bit more. I know I keep changing camera angles, but like I'm not a videographer. I am a guy who repairs things. So, Ooh, yeah, you guys are going to want to see this. Oh, this is like, <laughs> this is the next movie spectacular. Uh-huh. Yummy. Absolutely tasty stuff. <laughs> this poor guy's bored. I feel sorry for him. I really do. Man. Yeah, and see, here's your this right here. That's the actual, that's... Um, uh, uh, alkaline uh, from battery that didn't get uh, cleaned properly. So it looks like we really did need to take this socket off anyway to get under the socket and get all this this gunge out of here. Man. This guy might get this thing back without a slot one, to be honest. Scrape, scrape, scrape! I actually need, like, paper towels and cleaning supplies. Stand by. There we go. Use a little isopropyl. I'm going to scrub it. Just to kind of clean anything that is impeding my visual examination of the situation. Got to get all that crust out of there so I can see what's going on. Okay. You know, these traces are bad, but not surprisingly not as bad as I thought they would be. And this one is pretty bad. V has turned to, turned to rust. Trace is gone. These are all just destroyed. Aha! Here's my reminder to take my meds. Stand by while I do that. Got to have a slot one. I have my second sight VGA card slot one, yeah. And meds are taken. 
Retro Techie, don't forget too to mention Tinker Different. Yes! I mentioned that at the beginning of the stream, but I won't mention it again. Um, I don't remember the exact URL. It's tinkerdifferent.something.com. Tinkerdifferent.com. There is the URL for you guys. If any of you here love to tinker with anything, any old computer, any new computer, even things that aren't computers but are tech related, Tinker Different is the place for you. It was envisioned by several wonderful leaders of our computer community, including Bruce Brankus, Bruce Brankus, Bruce Rain of Brankus Creations, Steve of Mac84, and several other people, uh, Eric Helgeson of Blue Scuzzy, um, and many other people. They came together to create a an online community where we can share all our tinkery things to keep these old computers working. Apple, IBM, Macs, Chromemcos, S100 machines, anything you want. It's up there, and you can talk about it. Um, it is a very, it is a very democratic society, so to speak. And most importantly, there are backups upon backups, so you're not going to have to worry about posting some wonderful content up there or using it as a project log where you share things for people and then having it randomly disappear because somebody forgot to run the backup. It is completely automated. On top of that. They have actually tested the backup in a full failure scenario, and they got them site back up and running, so it was great. I work in IT, and one of the things we always say is, there is nothing more important than a customer's backups. And we do the same thing. We test customers' backups every month to make sure we can actually restore data from backups. And that's what they did. Yeah. This is just awful. This poor machine. You poor Apple II GS. Can I use Pokey Tool to kind of poke through these and clear these out maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure exactly. Not sure exactly. Yeah, that one's clear. Just trying to clear the salts and stuff out. The uh, cal or uh, the copper chlorides or whatever cal copper zinc amalgams or whatever that the alkaline uh, batteries do. Just cleaning out the vias, getting the gunge out. I mean, this is completely, I mean, we're not actually anywhere like doing anything with fixing this. I'm just cleaning it at the moment. <laughs> I also kind of need to get an understanding of uh, how bad this is going to be to actually repair for this guy before I get into the real repair, but whatever. I do have to get to a stopping point. We were talking about that earlier in the stream for any newcomers. We are talking about like, how do you go about charging and determining, well, this is beyond scope and all that stuff. Well, at this point, I kind of have to get an idea of what the scope is going to be. Eh, they're pretty cleaned out. Uh, this one may need a little work. Ew! Yucky! Clean this side off a little bit. Again, I'm just doing some preliminary basic cleanup work just so I have an understanding what I'm dealing with here. You guys need a little better focus? There you go. There you go. Oops, wrong socket. That's where we are.
Yeah, it's just the it's the gray goop. It's the gray lead salt goop. Make sure you wash your hands, kids. You don't want to ingest this stuff. Don't want to get it in you. Lead is bad for you. Makes your brain stupid. Reading comments again. So I can white vinegar in the until the board ceases to exist. Yes. Nice apple board. <laughs> Go back and watch the beginning of the stream. You really think it's a nice apple board? Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Fail. Rudy, if you want to run GSO, ask people talking, having their own side conversations. That's cool. Yes, if you have a GS and it has a battery in it, get the battery out. Remove the battery. Now, all the battery does is it keeps date and time for, for, it just keeps the date and time. It doesn't do anything else. Um, in theory, it saves the settings for the slots, um, but, you know, if you are going to use a battery in it, solder in a, a battery pack that goes onto the side that has wire leads that go way off to the side and are away from the board, so that if your battery does destroy itself, it's going to be off the board and is not going to cause uh, problems. Man. Look at that via. You see that right there? Man. I believe this is probably, I don't want to say this is the worst board I've, I've, I've ever, ever had to work on, but I will say as of right now, it is the gungiest one that I've had to work on. Man, look at all that trace rot. Just, that's all trace rot, all of that. All these black spots, trace rot, gone. No trace, no trace, no trace, no trace. This trace is completely removed. Gone, gone. Via's filled with gunk. Via. Wow, there you go. Right there, there's a good example. That via, there's no via there. It's gone. That, that is an empty hole and is a dead hole to use a, a car reference when you have a dead cylinder. Dead hole right there. That, re that Somebody asked about that, how do you replace a bad via like this? You attach a wire here, run it through the hole, and then attach the wire on the opposite side. Some goop stuck in there. Wow. More dead traces here, just gone. Wow. Traces? What traces? There aren't any.
Hmm. I am thinking too that this board is a multi-layer board. And this right here makes me think of that. There's a via here that, here, I'll make it a little, add some moisture to hide some of the crap around it. So you can see that this doesn't go anywhere. There was no trace that this connected to ever. So what does this via connect to? What's its purpose? It probably goes to an inner plane. Now, if we're lucky, it's like uh, the S, is it the SE or the SE30? Um, the, the inner plane is mostly just a big ground plane or voltage plane so that it's just connecting to ground and that by having a via here or there that connects to that inner plane, the dead isn't going to like actually cause major issues. Um, it could actually be a signal wire that goes somewhere important. Um, and if that's the case, then what do we do about that? Well, I don't know what we do about that. Yeah, this poor thing. You poor baby. Yep, there's a busted trace. Poor thing. Wow. Just reading your comments. Stand by. Was machines are the worst Apple II GSs? Yeah, they're they're what the ROM zeros or ROM ones. They're not they're not that great. I'm a ROM three fan myself, but there are a lot of demos and games that don't work on a ROM 3 for some reason. Putting the CR2032s in your 2GS, yeah. I'm going to switch cameras to face cam because I'm going to sit and chat to you guys because, um, yeah, I don't think we're going to get really much of uh, anywhere tonight on this other than cleaning it. And since this is a client's board, I think I'm going to have to call it um, and get a hold of the client and point them to this stream and be like, so... Um, yeah, you need to watch the progress of this and see what happens so we can discuss what you want to do with it. Um, looking back on people's comments. Yeah, the clock doesn't work past 2020 anyway. It's not, is it the clock that doesn't do that or is that the, um, the ProDOS or, uh, or GSOS issue? There's a patch for that, but whatever. Um, if you don't need custom size for the slots, you don't need batteries anyways. Correct. Can you use static RAM instead of having a battery in theory? Arcade boards with batteries or pinball boards? Oh, yeah, that's that's a big thing in those, too. They came with the battery soldered on board. Lots of videos out there. Joe's Classic Arcade uh, uh, Classic Arcade Repairs on YouTube here does a lot of those repairs as well that you can check out. Um, uh, MV RAM, yeah, it can retain settings without power, but whatever, but it can't keep time. Again, because the battery doesn't just hold the settings, what it also does is it runs the clock. It actually runs the, the oscillator to keep the clock running. Um, we don't need no stinking traces. Yeah, if you don't want to work, you don't need traces. Um, how do you fix those traces? Um, yes, um, I'm not going to go to actually doing any trace repair on this video at this point because we've we've seen that this is um, a multi multi hour job at this point. I'm going to have to poke at it, put it aside, and poke at it, put it aside, and keep doing it for a long time. Uh, and that is if the client even wants me to continue working on it. Um, but basically, what you do here, I'll show you. I'll get some of the wire I use. So I use enameled wire like this, right? Can you show it? Yes, there you go. Super thin enameled wire. What enameled wire is, is it's just copper wire that has a, how can I put it? It has, it, it has enamel on it or, or varnish or shellac or some sort of um, coating on it. Um, instead of having a strippable plastic sheath that a lot of wires have, it has this this coating on it that's just, it's almost painted on, basically. Um, 
and it can be burned off with heat. So what you do is you add a little bit of solder to the trace. Here, I can, I can kind of show you here, scope cam. So what you do is you would go in here along one of the traces and add a tiny little, little thin film of solder to it. Then you lay your wire across that, that trace. You take your wire, and even this wire is too thick. I'm going to have to use my thinner wire for these traces. But you lay your wire across the trace, and you take a soldering iron. You add some flux, too, because you're going to need flux. You can't even see what I'm showing you. Um, you uh, add some, uh, some flux down, and you, and you heat that wire with some solder on the end of your iron. And that will burn off the, um, it'll burn off the enamel. And then this wire will solder itself to that trace. Then you go across, you bridge across the bad spot, like say this bad spot right here. You bridge across that. And then on the other side, you come down here and you do the same thing. You heat it up, you add some solder, you link it. Then you can optionally or preferably, you use your multimeter and you check on both sides of that trace to make sure that that it actually is linked up. And when you're done, you can take your knife and just cut the wire. Cut the wire, done. And then you've got a repair trace. Repeat odd infinitum until problem solved. Um, Nicholas, say, if you don't mind stripping it, wire wrap, wrap wire can work too. Yes, wire wrap wire. Um, uh, is helpful in so far as um, you don't have to use a lot of crazy heat and stuff to get it uh, to burn off the the enamel to get it to stick. The problem with it is that um, wire wrap wire, unless it's the really high quality Kyner wire, a lot of wire wrap wire that you just randomly buy um, has PVC coating on it and it'll just melt. Uh, and so you, you can have heat problems and it can it can actually wear through a little bit easier. So if you're trying to run a trace halfway across the board, um, you can get it to fall apart. And yeah, um, it, it, it is a viable option. I personally prefer to use um, to use enameled wire uh, under most circumstances. Uh, I did mention earlier though, fixing vias when there is something through the via, like a pin through that same via that also has connections on both sides of the board for traces, using a stripped wire wrap wire in that case tends to, in my experience, work a little bit better because the wire is already stripped and is ready to just take solder now. You're not trying to, did I burn it off? Do I have to pre, do you have to pretend the wire? You know, you just shove it through the hole, shove solder at it and goes, whoop and it sucks it through and it does the thing. So that's just my experience. Uh, everybody has their different way of doing things. You know, it is what it is. That's a nice looking iMac G3 back. I have an iMac G3. Yes, that guy right there. That is an original release, Bondi Blue. Rudy's Retro Into, do you work on mainframes? I haven't worked on mainframes yet. Use enamel wire to fix my Mac to FX board with a destroyed trace. Yep, yep. Always use 30 gauge Kynar wire for wire wrap. Saving a few cents isn't worth it. Generally, yes, I agree with you. Um, I've used both. Um, if I'm doing soldering stuff these days, I tend to use the, the Kynar wire because the Kynar doesn't melt. Um, if I'm doing a quick, dirty, cheap hack of something, uh, I've got uh, just, can you even see it up there? Yes. That, this stuff up here, I've got a whole row of, uh, PVC wire wrap wire that I use for like just quick board stuff. So, yeah. Whoop. But yeah, I think we're going to call this board for tonight. We're at about two hours and, and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to break and, and talk to the client about this. This is this, this, this board repair is just kind of, it's kind of gone off the far, the deep end at this point. Um, yeah. Um, Eric Cole, this was fun. See y'all later. See ya. Ski daddle. Craig off topic. How's the new M1 MacBook Pro doing? Yes, we can take a few minutes to talk about that. Uh, the M1 Mac Pro. So if you guys didn't see my live stream where I unboxed that, you can go back and take a look at that if you like. Uh, not a requirement, of course. Um, 
But uh, generally speaking, what I use my M1 Mac for uh, is for goofing off. Um, it's a media consumer for me. Um, I am, how can I put it? I was brought up in the Windows world. So for getting things done, I know how to use Windows faster and better than a Mac. That's not to say the Windows is a better than a Mac or that a Mac is better than Windows or PCs or anything like that. I just know how to use PCs so inherently it's like breathing. So I can just like sit in front of one and get crap done. That's just because that's how I was, I was brought up through the tech world. That's how I'm trained. So to ask me how the M1 Mac performs on like actual um, pro stuff, like you would actually use a MacBook Pro for, um, we did do a test on my live stream between me and Steve. Um, he gave me, you know, this um, this encode this this Final Cut Pro thing to encode, um, and I encoded uh, I encoded that project with it. And his dual three gigahertz uh, 12, 12 core twenty four thread Xeon took seven minutes and thirty seconds to encode it. The same project took my MacBook Pro three minutes and thirty seconds to encode it. It didn't get hot in the and the fans didn't even turn on. It just did it. It was like, okay. Um, so super fast. What, the screen is incredibly beautiful. The machine is, n it's not so fast. It's like, you click on web pages, it's like, it's there. It's just, there's no delay in doing anything. Um, launching applications, there's a slight delay if you haven't launched the application in a while because it, it is, it is, it's decached it once it once you've launched an app and if it's an app that you launch several times it keeps it cached in memory and it it loads like in a second pages a second final cut pro about 5 or 6 seconds um, safari browser instantly you click the button and the screen is there it's nuts the one thing that really surprised me was the odd the um the, the built in speakers um the this macbook pro has the best, best built in audio of any laptop, portable, anything I have ever seen ever in my life. And I've been doing this for 22 years. Um, it's, it's nuts. It's like surround sound somehow, like real stereo audio. It's better than any, the audio that comes out of that thing is better than any speakers that I own. It's better than my Sonos, uh, my Sonos room speakers. It's crazy. It is insanely good. Like, I can't, I just, I can't even, I can't even describe how good it is. The audio quality is nutso on that. Um, I am try, thinking about actually transitioning to using that for doing my video editing and my production process. Um, I have a, a potential way to get a Final Cut Pro in some sort of a, a promotional package, something or other, for less money because I'm related to somebody who works at... Uh, it works in education, so I might be able to get it. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Um, and if I can do that and find a way to move my process to that, then that's fine. Also, um, uh, DaVinci Resolve is free. So I can use, I could in theory install DaVinci Resolve and use that on the Mac as well. I did try to use DaVinci Resolve on this PC and DaVinci Resolve on this PC is, um, okay, I'm going to swear. It's ass. It doesn't work on this computer at all. This the computer I'm streaming from right now is a is a uh, is a Ryzen something or other. It's basically below what they call the Threadripper. What is it called? Uh, CPU. It's a Ryzen 9 3950X 16 core 32 thread with 32 gigs of RAM and a 512 uh, NVMe solid state, and it can't run DaVinci Resolve. It crashes, it hangs, and doesn't work. On this. Um, so I wanted to change to it, but didn't. I'm using some cheapo piece of software right now for my encoding and for my video editing called um, uh, Cyber Media Power, uh, Power Director because it works. It costs me $99 and it works. Um, but whatever, I don't know. Um, if you can get that educational pro apps bundle, it's a great deal. Exactly. That's what I'm going to look for. Um, I know somebody who works at a local university who might be able to help me out on that. I don't know. I've been writing software for 25 years and never even touched an apple. Am I missing anything? I don't know. Uh, you know, here's the thing. I, I see that I, 
I, Apple, the Mac, the whole Mac community is its own environment, nearly separate from the Windows environment. Are you missing it? I don't know if you're missing anything. I mean, it's just different. Is it better? Is it worse? Is it no? It's different like living in this town or living in that town. They're just, or living in this country and living in that country. It's just different ways of doing things. I don't know. How much was the Mac that I, that I purchased? Okay. So now we get to talk about money, um, which I'm usually reticent to talk about. Um, I will say that I have been saving up for this Mac for a while since I busted my MacBook Air. Um, but uh, I got the base model, which is $24.99. It is literally the base model at MacBook Air 14 inch. Um, I looked at all the specs and I was like, well, I could upgrade this or I could upgrade that. And I thought about my use cases. Um, do I need all those extra cores? Do I want, I didn't want, I definitely didn't want a 16 inch uh, a screen. That's just too big. Um, because of its primary role as a consumption machine, it's got to be, it's got to fit on my lap, right? Um, I didn't need all the extra GPU power because I don't play video games. It can help in video encoding, video rendering, but the thing is already probably faster than, than, than my Ryzen rig. So it's like, I don't, right. I don't really need all that GPU power. So, yeah. I'm glad you hear you like the M the M1 MacBook Pro. Mine's been due to arrive in a few weeks. Can't wait. Yeah cool. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really loved it. Primarily, the primary reason I like it so much is because it just, it gets crap done and it gets out of my way. Um, that's how I tend to, to work with my products. That, that's the same reason, you know, my windows rig here is so insanely powerful is because, um, you know, I try to go for the most power within my budget, no matter what it is. Um, when I get something that, when I get something that you shouldn't cheap out on, let me roll back a second. I'm like one of the cheapest human beings on earth. I don't spend money unless I need to, um, with rare exception. Things like a, a, a device that I'm going to be using every single day. That is going to get special attention. My phone. I stick with an iPhone. Why do I stick with an iPhone? Because it works and it gets out of my way. Um, my consumption device, why did I get the nice, the nice Mac? Because I want a Mac that just works and gets the heck out of my way, right? My encoding machine, why is it powerful? Because I want to click and code, walk across the room, grab something, come back and have a four, four or eight minute video encoded in, in 45 seconds. I want it to just crank it and get it done. Anything else? Nope. Nope. I'm a cheap bill. So it just, it's just how I am. I never buy stuff, but when I do, I spend big. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other reference to that is like all of this, all of my, my collection back here, the majority of my collection over the years have been donations or drop-offs. Um, I've honestly not spent a lot collecting this. Uh, I work at a computer repair shop. Well, we're a managed service provider now, but back in the day, we we fixed computers and people would just drop off these old machines when they died um, or when they were of limited use um, because like, do you recycle these? I'm like, I sure do. We can take care of that for you. And it ended up on my shelf. So suddenly Intel inside is liability, not an asset. Yeah, uh, these M1 processors are insanely, insanely efficient. And they get more done in less time with a lower clock and less consumption. It's the wonderfulness of the risk architecture. So, yeah. Uh, maybe Joe should play with Linux. Um, I do actually do stuff with Linux. Um, I tend to reserve Linux for what most people reserve Linux for, and that's for server stuff. My website runs on Linux. A lot of the websites that we manage for our clients run on Linux. I have a um, a Pi-hole server uh, running over, you can't see it over here, running on my virtual machines for local DNS, for local DNS sinkholing. That runs on Linux. Uh, I run Raspbian on Raspberry Pis for PBXs and stuff. So I run Linux, that's fine. I just don't use it as my primary thing because 
uh, like, as I've said before, I'm trained on Windows. So for me to throw Windows at a, a, a piece of hardware, install my software on it and make it work because I know how to do it like that, like breathing, it just gets done. That isn't to say Windows is better than Mac, is better than Linux. But for me, Linux, it's just layers and layers upon command line and what is compatible with what. No, I have to know how to know use make on the command line to compile this because the user didn't provide me with a binary. I can just double click. Hey, I don't want to deal with it. I just, a lot of people love Linux. They love to use that. That's awesome. I don't have the attention span to learn it at that level to use it as like an everyday operating system or stuff. I tend to just use it for servers. So yeah. If you use Mac OS X, you're running FreeBSD and it with an with an Apple overlay. Yeah, yeah, you are. You absolutely are. It's free SB free BSD as the X and U as X and U slash um, Darwin kernel um, with a wonderful graphics engine laid on top of it. Um and yeah, but the thing with the, with Apple is that they've done a really good job of putting the the Unix Linux not Linux the POSIX Unix stuff way way below, so the average everyday user doesn't have to deal with it. But it's there if you want to drop into the shell and do do all your Unixy Linuxy POSIXy Nixy stuff that you want. Yeah, Mac will do it. Yep, heck, I think it will even compile a lot of Linux apps. As long as you have the right um, tools, you can like take code, throw it on the Mac, and be like, okay, it'll just do it. So, yeah. Intel sucks. Go AMD cheaper, faster. Generally agreed. Intel is more reliable. Is it really? Is it? I don't know about that. When it comes to the PC world, if you're buying a pre built machine, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if it's AMD or Intel. The AMDs tend to be less expensive and have slight, slightly better performance than the Intels do. Um, if you're building your own box, either both Intel or AMD can give you all different types of funky compatibility problems. It's just the, been the way that building custom PCs has been since the beginning of time. It has nothing to do with AMD or Intel. Um, I've had AMD, uh, like this AMD box, has given me some problems that I've had to upgrade it. I've had to do BIOS flashes and, and um, driver updates and this and that to make it reliable. The machine before it was an Intel machine. I've had to do the same thing. Oh, my video encoder is randomly crashing. Oh, there was a driver update for my for my graphics card. Okay. It's just how it is. Um, so, yeah. 6502 is greater than I Intel and AMD. Yes. 6502 forever. Linux is a pain in the ass. Well, if you're not used to it, it is. Apples for are for hipsters. Dude, Apple was cool before everybody else was cool. Yeah. Linux isn't really a get stuff done and out of the way OS for everyday stuff. It, no, not necessarily. Now, if you know Linux, it, tab, it totally is. I know plenty of people who, who use Linux every day. I know a guy who works for Red Hat, and he uses Linux as his daily driver because he knows how to use it. In my case, I use PCs as my daily driver because I know how to use them. That's just how it is. So you can't really say that, um, in my opinion. So, yeah. Cyrix was trash, generally agreed. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we, we're just, <laughs> we're kind of just hanging out and chatting here now. But uh, I think we came to the conclusion conclusion tonight with this, the, the, this battery bombed board, so to speak, that it truly was, it was destroyed. Um, by this by this battery way way worse than the owner of the board realized um, the fact that he had it working and then I can't get it to work is probably because of this single um, diode that fell off during the cleaning process um, that is probably connecting something that should be connected and that's why it's not coming up um, but with all that other trace rot and stuff it was just gonna fail so I'm gonna have to contact him and that is where we are um, find or, uh, keep following because I will likely have some sort of update for this later. Justin Morgan. Hi. Yeah. I'm just ending the stream here in a few minutes. <laughs> Roll it back and find and watch. Um, but, uh, yeah, this board is just, it is in, Hey, Justin, I will show you real quick, uh, scope cam. It's yeah, it's trashed. 
that board is just destroyed. I had to take a socket out. We're missing a, a diode fell off of the board right here. Right there. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, follow along. Uh, come back later. We'll be likely live streaming more of this repair. Well, if, if the owner of it uh, wants me to do so, uh, wants me to keep fixing it. Uh, we'll come back around and fix it. But I got a lot of other stuff in the pipeline. My patrons, I've already had an update about that. So if you are want to become a patron of mine, go to uh, patreon.com slash Joe's Computer Museum. Um, I will uh, see if I can give you that link, link -a doodle. Um, here it is. If you want to become a patron, it's in the chatted chat. You can do that. And you can jump over there and learn about stuff ahead of time, behind the scenes things. Um, you get to get my non-stream and non-vlog videos at least 24 hours ahead of time. I send you stickers in the mail, all different kinds of cool stuff. And you help fund this hobby of mine to keep it going so that I can keep coming up here and showing you stuff. While you're here, if you like the stream, hit the like button. The like button helps the YouTube algorithm know what is cool, and it helps them know that they should be promoting me so, so more people can see this cool stuff, so I can share this stuff with more people, and more people get to learn about how to do board level report, repair and how important it is to get the darn batteries out. If you're not a subscriber, I don't know why you're watching me if you're not one, but if you're not a subscriber and you're catching this, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, so when I come back and I show this stuff to you or we do more videos, You'll get to know about that. Justin Morgan, can someone fix the notification algorithm? Yes. Yes, that is an issue. That is still a YouTube issue. But if you ring the bell thingy, you're going to be more likely to know that I'm going to be streaming than if you don't click the bell thingy. So do that. I'm going to go ahead and call it a night tonight, folks. Thank you all for hanging out with me. I do appreciate all your help and support over these years and coming by and giving me cool stuff in the chat and just hanging out with me. See you later, folks.